So today I'm going to talk about demystifying the ransomware and IoT threat. So about me, currently I'm a principal malware scientist at RSA, and uh, before that I was with Trend Micro, Trend Micro F-Secure, and the Bond. And it's always uh, I'm always happy to come back here because I get to see my old uh, friends and uh, colleagues from Trend Micro. And uh, you can follow me at Twitter at talks if you have questions or you have feedback about uh, my presentation or if you want to post something about what I talked about, please uh, feel free to uh, hit me up on Twitter. And uh, also, on the side, I write books. So these are the, the two books I've written. And uh, I'm also a co-author of Hacking School, Second Edition. And uh, if you have budget for books, order them. All proceeds go to my kids' college. <laughs> so college is expensive, so help me send my kids to college. <laughs> All right, so my presentation will be more about telling a story. Uh, I remember earlier uh, in my career, every time I do a talk or do a presentation, there would always be people that would fall asleep, people that would walk out. So I was thinking to myself, I think what's the best thing to get them engaged is to tell them a story. Uh, I remember that when I was a little kid, when I watched Sesame Street or Batibo, uh, the most interesting thing for me is that if they tell a story, and then I learn something. So hopefully you guys have learned something from my story. So one day, a guy named Sam got an email. So he's a, like a typical uh, soft analyst or a typical uh, researcher. So he got an email, and he said, this email looks like malicious. So the email he got is like this. So for the trained eye, this one is actually an email vector that's being sent by a uh, Nemocom. So in this email, you could see that uh, it says here, please, uh, please find the attached uh, invoice and all that. And then uh, there's a uh, zip file on it, and you're supposed to uh, unzip that and uh, leave whatever inside. But then Sam, being a trained uh, researcher, he said, you know what, this looks suspicious. I've attended training, I'm certified by my company as a security expert, so I'll get the attachment and analyze it for myself. So when Sam saw the attachment, it's not a PDF file, it's not a document file, it's not even, it's not even a text file. So there's no invoice in it. Instead, he saw this attachment. It's actually an HTA one. And when he opened the file, this is what he saw. He saw code. So what is an HTA file? It's an HTML executable file. Uh, it was introduced in 1999 along with Internet Explorer. We were teenagers way back in 1999, so I remember this really, really well. And uh, it's executed by uh, MSHTA.exe. It instantiates uh, IP and uh, I use the rendering engine and then it displays uh, nothing. It depends on how it's written. But the most important thing there is that uh, it, the code in the HTML file gets uh, executed. So since this train, uh, when you open the, uh, the file, this is what you saw. So if you look closely, I'm not so sure if you can see it, but uh, the series of uh, variables right here, Right there. Anyway, you'll get a copy of the presentation so you'll see it clearly. You could see there that there's a variable at the end that says X key. So usually, if it's a malicious HTA file or a malicious HTA script, a X key stands for XOR key. So you take that and keep it for later use. And the rest of the variables there, they also have their own purpose. But our purpose here, or Sam's purpose here, is to find out what this HTA file is for. So what he did is that uh, he went to the bottom of the script and looked for the last function that's available uh, right there. And uh, he saw that uh, down there is a variable or a function call, and he said, let me copy that function call and look for it in the rest of the HTA, HTA file. So he did, 
and he found it, he found the function call, and then he went through it, found the variable within the function, copy that variable, and then uh, look for it, and then he found it at the end. So right now I'm explaining it to you guys in a very fast way, because I've gone through it, but uh, for me to find out what those variables are and what to find, it, it took a lot of time. A lot of time, a lot of trial and errors, usually errors. And then uh, I found out that this is a foolproof way of finding out how malicious this HTA virus. So, what we're trying to figure out here, or what Sam is trying to figure out here, is what this HTA file is doing. Since he's undergone training, usually he knows that most HTA files. That, uh, that are sent to you by email are considered downloaders. So they would usually point the user to a malicious domain where that domain contains malware and that malware would be automatically downloaded to the victim uh, PC. So once you find the main variable, the next thing you need to find out is that is that variable really the one I'm looking for? So what you do you just add an alert on that variable. So uh, you type in alert after the main function where you found that variable, and then uh, close in parentheses the variable itself. And then once you do that, you could execute the HTA script on a uh, on a confined test machine, uh, not connected to any production network. And this is what you will see. So what you will see, the URLs will be revealed. And those URLs act are the ones that are serving malware to the system. And usually, uh, malicious HTA files or infection vectors, they don't rely on single URLs. They would have multiple domains, multiple URLs. And for this one, I think we were able to get a couple of variables. I mean, a couple of uh, URLs. So these are the URLs. So, Sam, being trained and all, he was able to find out all of these things. So he was so happy, he was saying, you know what, this is so easy. I could just grab the malicious file from those URLs and then analyze it myself. And so he did. So he grabbed those uh, files from those uh, malicious domains and then executed it in his uh, test machine. But of course, if you're not able to find this out if you're not able to find the malicious URLs. You just need to run the HTA script and then it would automatically download the malware anyway and then you could just uh, use any network monitoring tools and then you'll find out which URLs uh, the malicious HTA file connected to. So once he got the uh, malicious files, what he did is just executed it in the host. So uh, one of the uh, presenters from Accenture actually presented uh, different tools that were used in analysis. If I remember that, that's one of my favorite tools when I was a uh, friend of mine installer. So if you have it, if you don't uh, have it, just uh, Google it. And it's one of the uh, best tools to have, very easy to use. So what happens in the host? So what it does, it, it downloads file to, temp, to the temp folder, it's encrypted, and then uh, writes it to a DLL exe file and decrypts it using the key which is converted into a 32 byte hexadecimal. So, uh, what usually happens is that most of the malware that are hosted in malicious domains and malicious URLs, they're encrypted. Uh, they're encrypted because they don't want researchers that have to scan uh, malicious domains uh, to download their files and then analyze it very quickly. Because if it's encrypted, it will take a long time for researchers to have it decrypted, especially if you don't have the key. So that's why most of the samples that are kept in these malicious domains or these malware serving domains are encrypted. And the only way to decrypt them are the keys that can be, find, uh, that can be found inside the HTA file. So if he was going to get it himself, before he could analyze it, or before he could make sense out of it. Hello? He could just decrypt it using the uh, XOR key that he found from the HTA file. 
But let's say he didn't do that. So uh, he just run the HK file, it would download the malware, it would decrypt itself, and everything would be fine. You'd be able to find out what that malware is doing. So here, the significance of the temp folder is that uh, the malware uses that to download the encrypted version, and it does some uh, copying, moving of those files until it gets decrypted, and then it gets it gets injected or written as a DLL or EXE file. Uh, at the end of my presentation, uh, in my Twitter account, I would uh, post there the blog I've written discuss discussing how that folder is being used by malware. So you have no choice but to follow me on Twitter. So, he was so happy, he was able to figure it out. And he said, you know what, this is really easy. I think what I learned from my training really got me fired up. I don't need to contact my uh, our IT. I don't need to contact our security expert. I was able to figure it out all for myself. And uh, uh, if you have a Oh. We're going to this one first. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> to tell all his friends about it. And if you're a millennial like me, nothing happens unless you post it in Facebook. So he has to post it in Facebook. So what he did, he logged on to his Facebook account and he said, I wanted to tell all my friends about this because this is cool. And so he did. But then when he logged in his uh, FB account, this is what he saw. He saw a message from one of his friends. And there's nothing in it, it's just a photo file, it's an SVG file. So he opened that SVG file, and what happened is that uh, it brought him to this fake YouTube site. And you'll know it's fake because if you look at the domain, you'll know it's not YouTube. And it's asking him to download a, uh, an extension. So, so what he did? Uh, when he was sent to a fake YouTube page, he was asking him to download an extension. But that extension doesn't have any information whatsoever. So he knows that this page is malicious. So what he did, he uh, actually... Oh, this is what, what's about the extension. There's really nothing much to it, so you know it's malicious. So what he did, he examined the SVG file closely. So what's an SVG file? It's a scalable vector graphics file, XML, XML based, so you can put, uh, you can also put code in it, and it was introduced uh, in 1999. And uh, when you open the SVG file, it's actually a red dot. It's a small red dot. So it's just like you're being marked. So a red dot usually denotes a target. So when you get this uh, picture file in your Facebook Messenger, it's just like saying, you just been marked, you're now a target. So what he did is that, uh, you know what, let's figure out whether the technique Sam used in the HDA file would work on the SVG file. And so it did. But this one is much more easier because you can just go to the end of the SVG file and then uh, do trial and error on the variables that you see there. If you could see at the bottom of bar and then uh, the variables and then alert on them. And Sam, and, uh, Sam got lucky because once he did that, it actually revealed the URL. So he was so happy, he said, you know what, it's so easy, I can do the same thing over and over again. I can just download the, uh, the malware file and analyze it, and I have the XOR key, I could uh, decrypt it. So he said, you know what, this is so easy, so he went on his uh, merry way. So that's the uh, presentation for the ransomware. So he was here at uh, Rootcon last year, so this was taken last year.
But then since we still have like more time, there's actually more to the story. So Sam got a snail mail from a uh, grandpa. So how many of you still uh, get mail from your uh, grandparents? So I still get mail from my grandparents because they don't want to use computers anyway. They have computers at home, but they only, they only have Facebook open all the time so that they'll get notification of what's going on with their uh, grandkids or their uh, kids, your parents. So Sam was saying, you know what, I remember when I was a little kid, if my mom or dad won't buy me anything, I just go to my Lolo or Lola, and then uh, they would uh, buy me stuff. So if my grandma needs help, I'm going to go to grandma and uh, give her the help she needs. So he went to his grandma's house and this is what he saw. So if you've seen server, you know that uh, this is a uh, server. And the uh, server doesn't hide it itself, like most, almost all ransomware, uh, they don't hide themselves. They would have to tell you that you're infected with ransomware, it would play a sound, it would have this message, it would change your desktop, uh, desktop wallpaper, and you'll have a bunch of files on your desktop that when you click on it, it will tell you you're infected by server, you need to pay this amount of money. So what he did, uh, he saw an HTA file, on the desktop and said, you know what, I have experience with HTA files, so before we do anything with this, I want to make sure it's not infected. So he went to the uh, he went to the usual thing, he looked at the codes and it's not infected, so he opened it, and this is what he saw. It's actually telling them, you know what, you've been uh, victimized by server, you needed to pay this amount of bitcoins and uh, go to this website install uh, Onion, uh, Onion a Tor browser and you should be able to pay us. And the thing about the VPHTA file, it's so helpful that if the link that they initially gave you doesn't work, you just click on the button and then it will give you a new link. So like for this one, it says just copy and paste it and then you'll be able to pay. And then it actually says in the HTA file, don't worry, this HTA file is not in malware it's safe. So uh, they're not telling you, don't worry about it, uh, you can open this, you can read it, and it's perfectly safe. So they're saying it's not a uh, virus. So if you're familiar with what's going on in the US, wherein uh, there's so many fake news and alternative facts being presented, you'll understand uh, Sean Spicer saying it's not malware, but it's alternative software. So, the thing about server is that when you go to the main page where you have to pay, it will show you this page. Uh, it supports different languages. Of course, you will choose uh, English. And then they're so uh, into security. So they want you to prove that you're human. So that uh, it's, it's just like when you go to a legitimate website where it, you know what? We're not sure whether you're a robot or human. So you have to prove to us that you're human. That's how security conscious uh, the server actors are. And as with uh, any uh, businesses, they have a special price for a limited time. So if you want them to decrypt your files, you just pay them that amount of money because in the next 24 hours, it will be, uh, the price will go up. And of course, as any business, they also offer tech support if you have problems. Happily, their tech support uh, is much better than other companies, where right? if you have a problem with your cable provider or with your cell phone provider, you call a number, you get the runaround, until you, until you got tired of it, you just put up the phone. For them, you can uh, send them an email or send them a, well, not, not an email, but a text message using their website. And they would be able to right back to you very quickly, because they don't want to lose your business. They want you to pay them money so that they should decrypt your files. And as with other business, like in, 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 in the security business, we have what we call the drug strategy. We're in a, here, you try our product for 30 days, and then you get hooked, and then you have no choice but to buy the whole product uh, or subscribe to that product for the next year. So server, like any other ransomware, also offer the try before you buy. 
So the good thing about this is that uh, they let you test one file uh, for free. And uh, if they have grandparents and they have uh, their computers, usually they don't have nothing on their uh, computer. They just have social media open so they can keep tabs on what's going on with their relatives. And usually they only have like a single file there. And uh, that's because most of the pictures that they have, they really don't keep it in their uh, computer. So when you go to your grandparents' house, usually see all of your pictures, your parents' baby pictures, your baby pictures on frames, lining up uh, the stairs, or uh, all displayed on top of a mantle somewhere, and they're all on frames, so they're all displayed there. So they don't have really any digital, most of our grandparents that are non-technical users, they don't have any uh, digital pictures in their machines anyway. Which is good because uh, Sam realized that his, gra uh, his grandma only had only has one file in her uh, desktop. So he was saying, you know what, we don't need to pay them anything. Since you only have one file, we could just use their decrypting uh, capability, decrypt that, and then we're good to go. So they did, and uh, once the decryption is done, it will uh, save it as a, as a zip file. And then the zip file, when you download it, and then you and zip it, you'll have your picture file there. And the good thing about it is that uh, when you look at it, nothing really changed. But for this one, the next slide, this is the slide that I'm displaying right now. This is what an encrypted file looks like. So this is my dummy JPEG file or dummy uh, picture file. Right? I still have the JPEG signature so that the uh, any file or any uh, file detector tool would still detect this as uh, a JPEG file. But the rest of the bytes are just a, 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 So I know whether it's been touched or not. So if you can see here, only part of that file is decrypted by a server. I think it's uh, on the 640 application where server starts to decrypt the file. And the decrypted file looks like this. It will just... Uh, put it back to how it was before. And the good thing about this is that uh, really nothing changed. Even the date stamp of the file, when it was created, the last time it was accessed, the last time it was modified, all goes back to normal. So if you're an employee of a company that's really, really into security, and then you got victimized by a ransomware or server, and you don't want to get fired, so you shell out money to pay them. They could decrypt your laptop, and then when you come back to work, uh, put back whatever you have on that laptop to your server. Uh, nobody will know whether you've been victimized by ransomware, because everything about the file, all the metadata that's connected to the file, will not change. How, how the ransomware found it, it's how it would uh, restore it. Now, they, they decided it that way because they want you to pay them. They want you to believe that uh, if they can do this, no hassle, just pay them. But then of course, this changed when Petya came. So Petya actually disguised itself as a ransomware, when in fact it's actually a wiper. It doesn't have any decryption uh, capability in its codes. So most ransomware actors got mad on whoever uh, let Petya go because it's bad for their business. Because they're building trust, wherein they say, you know what, if you pay us money, trust us that we will decrypt your files. But with Petya, it changed the game completely. Because some people have to pay, there's some big companies that pay, and then they realize they pay for nothing. Because Petya had to cra uh, crash their system, it changed their uh, boot record, their MPR, completely destroyed whatever data there is on the hard disk. So, Sam was so happy and said, you know what, Grandma, we don't need to pay for anything. I decrypted the one file you have on your system. And he was asking Grandma, you know, uh, how come you don't uh, put this in a frame? Uh, what is this picture? So he opened it and it's a picture of Grandma and Grandpa with their uh, pussy cats right there. Wow. So you can see Grandma's pussy cats and Granddad's pussy cat right there. So, 
words of advice. So for us, this is common sense. But in reality, there's lots of people that are getting victimized here that are not as technically savvy as us, which is usually the target of opportunistic attacks. How many of you have gotten a text message from your non-technical relative saying, you know what, I can pay for our vacation uh, next year to Europe or to whichever country you like because I just met a Nigerian prince. He promised me to give me this amount of money if I deposit this amount of money to his bank account. So this might seem very simple for us, but it's actually very helpful for people that are not so technical. So don't just click on anything and open any attachments from suspicious sources. But of course, sometimes it's so juicy that you really want to open it and click on it. So if you get this is that urge, save it and open it in a test machine. If it's too good to be true, chances are it's not. So if people say there's forever, there's really no forever. Unless you're an employee. And back up regularly. Uh, use offline backup or use secure online storage. So like for me, I'm uh, very paranoid. I have offline backups and I also have uh, online storage with cloud backup. So Sam was saying to his grandma, Grandma, you're good. You're happy. You have your picture back. You don't have any ransomware on your system. So I'm going home. So he went home happy and he just wanted to relax and chill that Friday morning. So uh, in the Philippines, uh, are, are we familiar with the term Netflix and chill? So if you're a millennial like me, uh, we use that all the time, that term. If you don't know what that is, just uh, Google. So Sam wanted to Netflix and chill with his girlfriend. Because he just came home late, his girlfriend is a night shift nurse. So she said, you know what, I'll hang out in your apartment uh, Friday morning, let's just Netflix and chill. But then you cannot chill unless you watch Netflix, because that's the whole point of uh, chilling and doing Netflix. But then when Sam opened Netflix, nothing was working. There's nothing there. So he got frustrated and he said, you know what, let's just listen to music. And then he quickly realized that when he opened SoundCloud, Spotify, nothing was working. So he said, I need to tweet my friends about this. I need to tweet the support of Netflix, support of SoundCloud and all. But then he realized his, uh, his uh, Twitter account was unreachable. And then he said, you know what, Since I cannot access all of these services. I'll stop my payment to all of them. So he tried to log into his PayPal account, but then nothing's working. And then, as the day unfolds, he realized that the cause of the outage is actually uh, a botnet called Mirai, which is a DDoS attack turning Internet of Things into botnet of things. So what is Mirai? It's a malware that infects IoT devices for the purpose of using them for uh, DDoS attacks. So like in the US, uh, there are so many uh, devices that are now connected on the Internet. You have your smart home devices, you have cameras, you have your cars. Anything that you can control using your mobile phone are now connected to the internet. And most of the people that use them actually don't secure them. They just plug it in, use whatever default uh, configuration there is, and then they're good to go. So Mirai spreads by scanning IP addresses to find vulnerable IoT devices. And when it comes to scanning IP addresses, when you look at the code, it actually excludes some of the IP ranges that belong to the companies mentioned here, GE, HP, USES, DOD, and uh, IANA. Now, the reason why they're skipping this, I have no idea. But of course, if DOD, if you scan DOD IP range and they're able to detect your scanning them, of course they will go after you. But the rest have no idea why, why they're uh, excluding them. So, it uses a remote CNC to determine its uh, DDoS targets. So you can actually feed commands to it saying, let's DDoS www.thissite.com. And uh, when you look at the code, so the good thing about Mirai, is that you don't really need to analyze it that much because the code is already public, so you can just Google it. 
And if you want to remove anything from the uh, exception list, you can do that and then you can compile it again or you can add more exception uh, to the exception list. So how does the attack work? Uh, once it finds uh, vulnerable IT devices, uh, a device it brute, for, uh, it brute forces its way into it and it uses that, uh, it does that by using a list of common passwords. Once it's inside, it closes uh, SSH, talent, and HTTP ports. So it's just like saying, now that I'm in, I'll close the door so that I'll only be the one inside. And if there's another IoT malware there, it will try to remove it. And for this one, it's trying to remove uh, anime uh, malware, which is good for us uh, researchers, because you also don't need to reverse anime to find out how it works and to find out how to remove it. We just use the uh, IoT, uh, I mean the uh, Mirai, soft, the Mirai code for that. It's just like going back to the spy eye and Zeus days, where if you get a hold of a spy eye kit or a Zeus kit, and it has the capability to remove spy eye or Zeus, you just need to analyze how it does that or reverse it how it does that, and then you'll be able to use that code, to your solutions, to remove spy eye and Zeus. But of course, it's easy for me to say here, analyze this, analyze that, reverse this, reverse that. Of course, it doesn't take uh, just a few hours or days to do that. Sometimes it takes days, weeks, and months to analyze something. No, sorry, not analyze, but fully reverse something. So this is the common passwords list that Mirai has. So you can add to it, you can remove some to it. So you can make it much more smarter if you really want to go this route. So as I said before, the source code is already public. Uh, it was uh, one of the author, uh, one of the entity that claims to be an author of uh, Mirai is uh, Anna Senpai. So Senpai is actually Japanese for upper classes. So if you're taking uh, any karate classes, you'll know that uh, before you become a, sen a sensei, someone who teaches, you become a Senpai first, which is an upper classman. And then if you're really, really good, you want to teach, then you become a sensei. So what happened uh, that day that caused us the uh, EDOS IoT uh, fiasco? So Dyn uh, is an internet infrastructure company headquartered in New Hampshire. So somebody attacked them. And the first wave started at 7 a.m. Eastern time. Second wave started around noon and third wave started around 4 p.m. So during those times, most of the services like Netflix, PayPal, were affected. You cannot log into them. And traffic to Dynasty Internet Directory was flooded by requests from millions of IP addresses. So take for example, you have uh, 1 million uh, cameras, or smartphone cameras, instead of them sending information to the right location, they're sending information to these uh, to die, Fl completely flooding their system and uh, rendering their system useless. So, what Sam did is that uh, you know what I need to find out more about Mirai, and this is what he found out. So, September 20, 2016, Greg's website was DDoS, and then October 1st, Mirai source code was leaked. 21st, time was DDoS. So I'm guessing here it took people 20 days to actually get the source, the leaked source code, uh, modify it for themselves, compile it again, and then launch uh, the attack on Dyn. And then one month, one month after the attack, Oracle bought Dyn. So that's why there's a joke in, in the industry saying, you know what, if you want to be bought by, by a bigger company for big money, just get attacked or get yourself in the news anyway. Uh, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Every publicity is still good. And then January 17, 2017, Krebs identified the alleged Mirai author and he wrote about it in his blog. So, after the thing about Mirai, you could protect yourself from it if you just secure your IT devices. So you do that by changing the default username and password disable unnecessary remote access to the IoT device. Usually you just need to access it via your mobile or your desktop and then any other access to it, if you don't need it, just turn it on. 
And uh, there's a US CERT advisory about it. So these are the preventive steps according to US CERT. So I won't read them. You can just read them once you have copies of the, uh, the slides. If you want to take pictures of them, I'll, uh, or not. And then you'll have a copy of the slide. And then you realize, you know, you know what? I'm contributing to this attack. Some are saying, I'm also responsible why I can't have Netflix and chill. Because most of the devices in my home have default configuration. So he said, you know what? I need to change my device's passwords before it's too late. And this is what happened. And then he realized this is going to be a very long thing. The Hopefully you guys learned something in that story. And uh, feel free to ask questions now or later by uh, uh, Twitter account. And if you want to uh, link with me, there's my LinkedIn address. And thank you again. Thank you again uh, for inviting me. If there are no more questions.